Welcome to the China Meta Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Fulton, a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlanta Council and a political scientist at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. Through my work, I talk with a lot of people in the Middle East about their perceptions about China, and I frequently hear an interesting range of opinions. However, it's not an especially scientific approach. I'm usually talking with academics, students, officials, or journalists, and a few people at a time. To get a true sense of what folks are thinking, we want data on a much bigger scale. On this episode, we've got just the right person to talk with, Dr. Michael Robbins, who is the director and co-principal investigator of Arab Barometer, which is the largest repository of publicly available data on citizens' views in the Middle East, North Africa. Michael has been part of the project since its inception, and serving as director since 2014. He has led or overseen more than 100 surveys in international contexts. And is a leading expert in survey methods on ensuring data quality. His work on Arab public opinion, political Islam, and political parties has been published in many of the top journals in the field. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. So, Michael, just to start, the Arab Barometer reports on China over the past few years have been incredibly useful for me and for a whole lot of other people who are thinking about China media. For those in the audience who aren't familiar, what is the Arab Barometer? What countries are you looking at, and how long has it been running? So the Arab Barometer is、uh, a public opinion survey、uh, that conducts nationally representative public opinion surveys across countries in the Middle East, North Africa, for the largest and longest longest standing project of its kind. And we were founded in 2006, and we did surveys across、uh, seven countries in the region.、Um, since then, we've conducted surveys in more than 17 countries in the region. We have done surveys in almost all the major、uh, countries throughout the the core Middle East and North Africa at this point. Um, what we really try and do is work to understand the views of citizens to、uh, build capacity and disseminate knowledge. So what we do is we document surveys through regular、uh, surveys about every two years to see、uh, track changes over time. For example, we then work with the partners to help increase their capacity to do this work. So others who want to do re- survey research can help do that. And then, as we're doing here, disseminating the knowledge of what we find, trying to really bring the views of ordinary citizens to the table. To date, we've done more than 125,000、uh, personal interviews with、uh, with ordinary citizens across the region,、um, and and we've done this over seven ways. So we have fairly good data tracking、um, the the views of citizens over the last、uh, really 15 years. Cool. And for the purposes of your your surveys and interviews on China,、um, which countries have you been looking at? So we've looked at a, a, a huge range. We have essentially all of North Africa in this report. So in our last wave, in our seventh wave, we did twelve、uh, different countries. We did Mauritania, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia,、um, Libya, Sudan, the West Bank and Gaza, Palestine,、uh, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq.、Uh, unfortunately, we also filled the surveys in Egypt and Kuwait, but we were not able to actually include those、uh, types of questions based on some of the challenges we faced with、uh, with getting. Um, permission from the the relevant authorities to do the the survey safely and securely with the the citizens. Yeah, I'm sure that's always a, a a tough needle to thread in the region. It is. It's something that we really work at because it, it、um, we do want to include the data. We want to get the data from other countries, and certainly there are some countries that we don't have. We don't really have as much coverage in the Gulf this wave as we would like to. We're still working to to try and get free and fair access to a number of countries there to include those as well. But it is、uh, something that we have to be able to do the surveys safely. We've worked a lot. We have done some phone surveys、uh, in the past, which we have found some variation in terms of response patterns based on phone or face to face, which we can't explain. It seems like it's a mode difference.、So、we do believe the face to face is the most secure,、uh, and, and the way that we can do it in the person's home so that it is a place that they feel safe and、uh, and providing their truthful opinions. So it is something that's very important for us to do. But it does require us to work with、uh, the authorities to make sure that we have. Access and that we aren't going to put either the interviewers or the people who are answering the survey at risk. So unfortunately, we do lose some of the data, which is something that we regret. But、uh, but it's the only way to really go about what we do、uh, safely and securely. Yeah, totally. But I mean, still, you you know that the the list of countries you you just named off is is pretty impressive. But how many people do you say you you spoke with in this round? So, so this wave we have、uh, almost twenty six, or we have over twenty six thousand interviews. This wave, so、um, in most countries we have about twenty four thousand interviews. So it is a wide swath. I should say that it covers the entire country. We go to all the regions of the country. We divide the sample so that everyone is, has a roughly equal probability of being included. So, in this report itself, we、uh, we include about twenty three thousand interviews、um, with with citizens. So it is a huge 
uh, trove of data. And it really, I think, gives us a much more complex picture of what's happening across the region. I think there's often a focus on either the U.S. or, or on China in certain countries, but this really does give us the the whole uh, the whole region. And I, you know, at, at one level, if we think about the population of all the the Arab countries or those that are in the Arab League, um, we have about two thirds to seventy percent of the population covered with these surveys themselves. So it is a very broad scope of uh, across the region. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, so you issued a new report in August, right? Public views of the U.S.-China competition in MENA. What does it tell us about perceptions of China around the region? So what we find is that China remains relatively popular, um, that in, in almost all the countries of survey uh, and all but one, we see that at least half or roughly half say that they have a positive view of China overall. Um, so that is particularly true in a place like Algeria, two thirds, and Morocco, 64%, and Mauritania, 63%. So we do see that China is relatively popular, um, at least in terms of overall favorability. But we want to disentangle that a bit more. And so we ask a number of other questions as well. And I'm trying to think about what is it that actually leads to China being um, uh, popular. And so we do find it at different levels who ask about closer economic ties, which is a question we've asked for a number of ways and have some trend data on. We do see that uh, that fewer want closer economic ties with China than they say have a positive view of China overall. So in only two countries do we see a majority saying that they have a positive or they want closer economic ties with China, which is uh, is Tunisia and, and, and Libya. But, um, but overall, we, we see that in about half and uh, four people in four countries want closer ties with China, a minority in four countries. What that really means as a takeaway is that China tends to be the most popular global power. It's more popular overall than the U.S. or, or than Russia. And you know some of the surveys are done before and after the invasion of Ukraine, but that didn't seem to affect opinions massively overall. But China is really the most popular global power at this point. Um, but it is one that actually trails some of the other regional powers. So a country like Turkey tends to be more popular in, in the majority of the countries we survey than China. But still, China's popularity is relatively high and, and seems to be holding up in the region overall. Yeah, it is interesting. I, I wonder because just anecdotally, when I talk to my students or I talk to people here in the UAE, um, there tend to be very positive perceptions of China. But typically, if I ask, you know, more probing questions, um, it tends to be a little softer, you know, and it, I, I find that really in the region, one of the recurring themes in a lot of the conversations we've had on this podcast is that China is still kind of the new actor in the region and people don't really have as much information about it as they thought. So I, I always wonder about the, the, this kind of data, if that if it's kind of soft or if, you know, more experience might change perceptions a bit. I think that that's a, a really important point. I, for our sense, it's actually interesting that we only started asking about China in 2018 and 19, that really China had not played such a significant role in the region, obviously, as it started the Belt and Road Initiative and uh, really started its, its engagement. It's increased particularly strongly in, in recent years, and the, the number of, uh, of, of deals it signed with different countries in the region, almost all are at least in some way part of the Belt and Road Initiative now. So it certainly is a player, but it is a very new player. I mean, obviously, there's historic links with China, but in its, its new form, it is something that, that we are seeing coming through. And, and I think people don't necessarily know what to think of it. I mean, if they think about China... You know, we, we've tried to find different ways, and, and I'll go into some of this as we, we go ahead in terms of different ways we try and think about how are people actually conceiving of China. But it does seem that as a non-colonial power in the region, as one that has um, had a relatively successful economic transformation, there's a lot to, to think that China is relatively popular. It is something that people may look to in the region. But at the same time, our own sense is that people don't necessarily have strongly informed views, that there is kind of this view of China. Um, but it is something that isn't isn't a long-standing relationship that people don't necessarily know it as well um, as they they might with the U.S. or with the colonial powers who are active in the region, or with Turkey or some of the Gulf powers who've been long-standing powers. So I think there is kind of a newness, and you can almost, I mean, one of the things I think about is if you look at some of almost the old books about the United States and uh, how it was viewed in the region in the 1950s, it was a non-colonial power. People had a positive view, thought it might be something that could bring positive change, and obviously, over time, I think that that's gone down. Our surveys show that the United States is not um, overly popular in a lot of the places, but it is almost there's a new hope in China that I think may not be fully realized. And as you say, and as our report finds, that some of this may be, some of the, the, the shine of China may be fading. And it's something that I think we will likely see in the future, um, based on what we're seeing now, is that, that as people get to know China, they may start to have more um, 
more nuanced, more kind of strongly felt opinions as opposed to just this kind of general view that China may be a better actor than, than some of those that they've known for a long time that haven't necessarily led to the change that they want. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I, I think that applies really to almost any extra regional actor in, you know, in the Middle East that, you know, the less history there is, the less baggage there is, the, the more positive the view is going to be. And then, you know, more interaction leads to more opportunities for, you know, the, op the relationships to go well or to, to, you know, go not so well. So it seems kind of a natural uh, cycle, I guess. Exactly. And I think that's one of the things we are seeing here is that when we've asked about the trend about China, about economic ties with China, we, we saw that it was relatively um, popular in, in the last surveys we did face to face in 2018 and 19, that citizens wanted um, closer economics with China, uh, closer economic ties with China, but we've seen that decreasing now, actually. In two cases, in the case of Palestine and Jordan, we've seen 20 point declines in only three or four years um, in terms of the desire for closer economic ties with China. In many of the other countries around the region, we've seen that this is actually also in decline. Um, in Morocco, Sudan, and Libya, we've seen ten point drop in just in just three or four years, and so it does seem that that people are updating this in terms of the economic engagement. Perhaps that China is taking place, and then you can think about what they may be looking to is thinking through how that type of engagement, what that's looked like in their country to the extent that it has taken place, and people are saying maybe this isn't all it's cracked up to be. Basically, that uh, we are losing that, and, and by comparison, if we think about the United States, as you're saying, with a long term partner that people know. But when we ask that same question, we haven't really seen declines. We've seen declines in two countries in terms of close economic ties around the same period, but the rest of the countries are basically stable or going up. So there does seem to be kind of a negative trend uh, towards China that, again, it's still popular, it's still holding up overall, but that the, the trend that we're seeing in the, the data for at least closer economic relations is one that's moving away from China and that perhaps China's kind of not as shiny as it was, as, as I said, and, you know, that it is something that will likely decline as as there is closer economic engagement, particularly as China is, is looking at this model. And even as you think about what China is doing now, you know, obviously with the, what's happened in Pakistan, what's happened in Sri Lanka, what's happened in a number of other countries, as they're really thinking about how do they actually do this type of engagement, I think that likely they're responding in some ways to what they're seeing on the ground, which is that there isn't necessarily the warmth that there might have been initially in places like the Middle East and North Africa towards uh, its, its model of engagement. Sure. Um, so I have to admit, I'm not a, I'm not a, quant guy at all. So when I'm looking at, you know, big sets of data like this, it, it kind of overwhelms me. Uh, but, you know, you're saying that you guys started tracking China in the region about 2018 or 2019. Is it normal mm -hmm. to see this kind of fluctuation in such a short period of time? It's, it's pretty atypical. I mean, we have seen this type of fluctuation in a few other countries. Like, I mean, for instance, um, in, in a place like Tunisia, um, after uh, its relationship with Saudi Arabia, it declined fairly rapidly. Um, after things like, uh, you know, Hishokji and after certain, you know, tensions with Ali being in Saudi. So we do see movements like this at times, um, but it is something that is pretty unusual. We do not typically see such large-scale movements across the entire region as we are seeing here in China. So it does, I think, as we would say in, in, in the political science world, that it is an updating, that people are updating their opinion, thinking through and really refining that. And I think we do see a, a shift here. And I mean, even, for example, with Russia and Ukraine, we did do some surveys in, uh, that were actually taking place when Russia invaded Ukraine, and that essentially didn't move the needle I mean, on Russia, that, that basically there was very little change. So you do think about a 20-point change in, in a place like Jordan, where we've seen this, this shift. One in five Jordanians has changed their opinion in China negatively um, over the course of the last four to five years. That is a huge, huge shift and something that I think is um, likely to continue going forward. And and we, we do have some data um, that we, we looked at. And, and partly to delve into this a bit more, we looked at this question about how does um, how do how is China, how is Chinese investment viewed? And so we asked a, a setup that's uh, in detail in the report, and it's it's a bit complicated, but it is asking about basically five different countries that you have if they a company from that if a company from that country were uh, coming in to do an investment project, what would your view of that be? And so we ask a number of different questions, and so what we really see with China is that Chinese companies are viewed as by far the cheapest across the entire region, that they would build the, the infrastructure project for the least amount of money, but they'd also build by far the lowest quality. I mean, that comes through without question in all of the countries that we survey. Is that essentially, the Chinese engagement is viewed as relatively cheap and relatively um, low quality um, compared to countries like Germany or a colonial power or the United States, that this is viewed as much higher quality overall. And so China's brand name is one of essentially, um, you know, relatively not 
this is essentially how China is engaging economically across the region is it's not viewed as particularly well. We ask how would the Chinese company versus another company, American or German or, or a colonial power such as France, treat the local workforce. We also see that China is not particularly favored on this. They don't pay the best salaries. They don't treat the local workforce the best in people's mind. So China doesn't necessarily have that sort of brand name in terms of its economic engagement across the region. Instead, what we see is that you know Germany is viewed as building high quality, and uh, and you know America is viewed as typically treating the local workforce the best. Um, and so there are some differences here that are important, and I think that that really feeds into the engagement that, that China may be viewed as somewhat popular overall, but as it engages more, it does seem that that the engagement is not one that's bringing China in a particularly positive light. And when we ask overall, who would you most prefer? What countries? What a company from which country would you most prefer to get the contract? kind of rarely comes up. Only in Iraq is it um, the, the country that is most preferred. And you can think about that. They just signed a deal at the time of the survey, basically. They signed a deal with China to try and increase investment. There was some positive energy around that. But elsewhere, it's not the most preferred. Generally, it's a German company or an American company that is the most preferred to do the work. And so as China actually comes into the region, comes to start engaging in the region and doing more of the the, the work that it is intending to, it is likely that this isn't necessarily going to benefit China overall. And I think that that's probably where we see this desire for closer economic ties decreasing, is that the, the way that Chinese companies and Chinese engagement are viewed is not particularly positive in the, the survey data that we have um, for most of the countries. Yeah, so there are a couple of, I mean, that, that's really interesting. There's two things that come to mind immediately. And one is that, again, because it is like a, a four-year snapshot, um, I wonder, like smack dab in the middle of that, we've got covid and I wonder if that, if China's response, if that might have had a, a negative impact on how, you know, certain countries in the region saw it. And then the other thing I was wondering is if you're surveying, you know, the wealthier countries in the Gulf or Israel, if people might have a different view. Because I remember talking to a Chinese um, project manager who had spent some time in Dubai and spent some time in Tehran, and he said. You know the Iranians were constantly bitterly complaining about the low quality Chinese goods and, and, and services right. and, and infrastructure, and his response was, "Well, your country's economy is not very good, and this is what you guys can afford. If you went to Dubai, you'd see the good stuff." And I wonder if maybe there would be some variation between you know levels of wealth in certain countries if they'd have a different view on this. It'd be really interesting to see if you're able to get into the Gulf later if uh, if there would be a different uh, view there. You know, I, I would have to speculate here a bit, but I, I do think you're right. I do think that certainly the, the engagement in the Gulf is very different um, and, and the way that China's there. But I also think that there is a bit of a different, as you're hitting at, kind of power dynamic between the Gulf powers and China itself, that in a way, they come as kind of an equal footing. If, if China moves into these countries or not for economic engagement, it, it can really be on the terms of the Gulf countries. They can set the, the terms and figure out what are the projects that make sense and work. Whereas I think in other countries, I mean, China comes in and is offering, you know, cheap development or cheap developmental aid in a way to, to build some type of project. I mean, certainly it is something that I think those governments are, are more likely to accept and perhaps on terms that are not necessarily as favorable. So not only I think is it the economy in a place like Tehran or others, but it is the fact that the that even just the promise of this development for something of that nature is something that, that China is willing to do that perhaps um, other powers aren't. And so I, I do think that the views in 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 the Gulf would be fairly different. I'm, I'm really, it's unfortunate we, we didn't have this in Kuwait this way, but I think that would have been a really interesting case given how um, strongly linked the two economies are uh, in, in Kuwait, uh, between Kuwait and China. Um, but we don't have that. But I, I do think that probably you'd have a, a significantly different view just because the Gulf is so, so different and the types of engagement, the way that the engagement's structured, and even the, the relationship is just so different than the, essentially China being almost a donor country, um, one that's coming in or perceiving it portraying itself as a donor country coming in to do these projects. And, and I mean, again, I think we've seen a fair amount of evidence that, you know, China's, the, the rulers also benefit from this in a lot of these countries and certainly the main, the Gulf, but I think there is a higher standard there. And, and, and again, it is, it is too bad that we can't compare this in the Gulf because I do think we'd likely see somewhat of a different relationship there. Yeah. Um, and in Israel, I think it's harder to, so go ahead. No, no, I'm um, sorry. What were you going to say about Israel? I was just going to say, in Israel, I think it's a bit harder to say. I mean, we certainly see a very negative perception of China amongst the Palestinian population. We do survey some of which is in Israel. Um, it is actually the lowest of, of any. And in some ways, I think that the Palestinian issue is, is viewed so strongly through the the peace uh, agreement, or I'm sorry, the you know the conflict with Israel, um, that basically China isn't necessarily playing much of a role there. So what we do see is that Turkey comes through really strongly there. But I think you know that's kind of an exception. But it is harder for me to say. 
Um, we unfortunately don't survey Israel in the, the survey itself, so we don't really know how, how Israelis would view this um, relationship. But again, it, it is likely different for some of the same reasons as for the Gulf. Yeah, totally. I mean, so in the Israel case, I mean, I was just doing a, a, a study looking at Israel-China recently, and when you look at a lot of the stats, around the region, what you see is Chinese companies doing a lot of contracting, but not a lot of investment. And then in Israel, you have the exact opposite dynamic. So, you know, an advanced or an advanced economy is going to come to China in a different way. And I think that point you make about that, that, uh, that uh, different relationship between, you know, the haves and the haves not, I mean, that's something that about the Belt and Road kind of debt trap narrative that's, that's bothered me as somebody who studies this is, of course, when, when a country like Pakistan, you know, gets offered $46 billion in MOUs from China, there's no other player, you know, that's going to offer that, right? So it does create a, right. a very big asymmetry there, where these Gulf countries, you know, they're, they're FDI magnets. A lot of countries or companies want to invest here. So the, the dynamics are pretty different depending on, on where you look at this, I think. I, I think that's the case, and it is, um, you know, we, we do have, um, for example, it, I mean, I think Algeria is actually an interesting case here that does have some oil wealth, um, for example, and, and is a member of, of, of OPEC, things like that. It is it is something that we do see, um, you know, they, they're not very open to Chinese investment, and they're not generally open to the outside world to, to the same extent as other countries. They are more suspicious, fair enough. They have a very positive view of China overall, but they don't have a positive view of closer economic relations with China that, you know, two thirds say that they want, uh, you know, they have a positive view of, of China itself, but they, they really are not engaged in China economically. And so I do think it kind of comes back to this idea of the brand and, and perhaps the, the need, um, you know, certainly that there is an advantage to having infrastructure that could be fairly, given the economies of these countries, it is fairly cheap. I mean, there is a real advantage of that over paying, you know, premium for something that may not be. So I think it is a fair point that, but there, there is a, a difference there. But, but certainly, as the governments are trying to make some improvements, is trying to build infrastructure and get this done. China is the obvious partner in many ways, given the, the way it's doing it. But as you're saying, there are real costs that come with that. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if, and it is something we don't really have a way to, to grasp entirely, but certainly the experiences of the debt trap of, of say, Pakistan or Sri Lanka or um, you know, even Malaysia or something like that is starting to build into some of the narrative as, as people are more suspicious about um, potential investment. And I think that is the gap we see between economic ties and the perception overall is is kind of a key um distinction there that 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 as people start to associate china more perhaps with the economic pieces that likely that other piece about views about china overall will likely come down yeah you know you mentioned algeria and to me that's an interesting case because what you see between china and algeria is a lot more political cooperation you know like there's this old you know like revolutionary connection between the two and you see the, the Communist Party engaging a lot more than, say, SOEs do, where that doesn't really take mm. place in a lot of the Middle East. And I talk to older Algerians, and they have these memories of China, you know, sending, sending food, sending milk, sending, you know, aid back in, you know, back in the day when they needed it. So they have, tend to have fonder impressions for, for more ideological reasons, I guess. Um, no, yeah, I, I think up, that, that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Uh, I just go say you made a really interesting point a, minute, a couple of minutes ago when we were talking about um, you know how Gulf leaders might see it differently, and that's something I wanted to explore a little bit because um, I wonder is there a gap between elite perceptions and public perceptions of China in the region? Is this something that shows up in your in your uh, data? It, it is something we see. So I mean, I think there's a couple ways to look at this. One of the ways we can look at elites is more broadly than just the, say the political or the the, the regime itself is to think about those who have a higher socioeconomic status. So those who are educated, um, who have, say, a college degree or above, and those who don't. We generally see that China is, is viewed more positively amongst those who are elite. I mean, for example, in Iraq, those who have a college degree um, are 16 points more likely than those who do not to actually have a positive view of China. We see something that's similar in Lebanon, 11 points, and a, a similar gap in Morocco of 9 points. So in a, a broad sense, we do see this in most of the countries, in all but two countries, really, we do see this kind of gap where there is a more positive view of those who have a higher level of education in the survey. So there is a broad sense that the views of China are stronger amongst the elites. And in some ways, that may be, again, a familiarity that that um, some of the people who have a lower level of degree, they don't have a strong opinion about public affairs. They may not necessarily, or sorry, international affairs. They may not necessarily have such a strong piece, but it does seem that the elites are leading in a way on China, saying that this might be an attractive partner or something uh, beneficial. 
And certainly I do think we see the regimes, given the, the fact they have signed these agreements, the uh, political elites are certainly very engaged with China. Um, but that is backed up with, again, that, that class of, of people who it's a kind of a somewhat crude measure, but at least somewhat being the educational elites in most of the countries that we've surveyed. Um, not quite all, but in the vast majority saying that, yes, I mean, China is uh, a country that they favor more highly and, um, and one that, you know, again, they would want, um, they, they have a better view of. But again, it is kind of interesting to that same point that when we ask about the economic relations with China, we don't see these same differences um, in, in by education, that basically those who are more and less educated by at least measure of college degree don't have differing views. So it does seem that, that perhaps as you're saying that some of the, the views of China itself, thinking about what China represents or as a, you know, as a power, as a new power, one that has um, certainly developed that kind of model that has helped a lot of people come out of poverty in China itself, that elites who may know about that or have a more positive overall, but it doesn't necessarily seem to affect you know, the desire for the closer relations. And there isn't a, a link between education and that through what we found in the surveys um, this wave. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, looking at the results from the report, I mean, did you see any kind of, so obviously some country, you, you mentioned a few countries that had the highest or the, the lowest opinions of China. Was there any kind of um, logic to this you saw was based on region or, or economics or, or exposure? So I guess what were the countries that had the highest, the lowest, and maybe if there's any anything behind it that you think explains that? Sure. So the, the countries that we have that have the highest uh, support for, for China overall in terms of just the overall views were Algeria and Morocco. And I think, you know, some of what you suggested with Algeria may explain some of that the historic links there. We're a bit surprised with Morocco. Um, honestly, Morocco is always in a place that's viewed the U.S. pretty favorably as well. But it is it is one uh, that, that has had strong views towards China. And it may be, again, as you were suggesting with COVID, a lot of the vaccines um, for COVID from in Morocco came from China. That was a, a, a key source of of vaccines and so it may have actually led to some positive views in, in, in Morocco as well. Um, we see it as well as Mauritania, which um, honestly I, I'm not as sure about in terms of why that would be the case. Again, it's a poorer country. It's one that I think you know may have a, a need for more investment and seeing you know some of the investment as attractively as a place and also in Sudan, um, a place that has historically been somewhat cut off from the U.S. because of the being a state sponsor of terrorism or on the U.S. state sponsor of terror list. You know, had to look to other sources. And so it may be that, you know, because of that, China is something that is um, viewed, you know, more favorably as an alternative to the U.S. historically. Um, but we, the place that we, again, in almost all the countries, we see at least half. So it, it, again, this is the higher end of the range, those who are more than six and 10. I mean, again, the place that really does stand out is, is the Palestinians, um, that they really have a negative view. And again, I think that is a very issue specific um, that, that China hasn't really done much to try and, you know, necessarily um address the issues of the, the the tensions with israel with the conflict with israel so certainly as we look at them they're actually quite negative towards every group except the turks uh, the turkey which has actually done you know a lot more on that dimension but but certainly we don't actually see as much variation i mean it really does seem that china across the region most of the countries uh we survey it's between half and two-thirds saying they have a positive view so mm -hmm. um again it isn't something with a, a lot of variation um which i think is a bit surprising given that that you would think that given the different histories, given the different pieces that there is. But again, I, I think it hits at what we were talking about before of this kind of the newness of China. It isn't necessarily a well thought out view. Um, you know, one of the things that we've tried to look at this way is thinking about what are the issues that really define China. And so we talked about some of the economic ones, but also one of the political ones that I think has been coming up is the Uyghur issue, that the Uyghur Muslim community has been one that, I mean, has, has basically been put in open air prisons, um, essentially in, in um, the, in, um, China and, and places. And, and so as you look at that, um, does this actually have any effect? I mean, this is a, a co, most of the region is Muslim. Does this have any effect? And we find is that there's actually very little knowledge of this issue, that people don't seem to know that this is happening or existing. And so it is something that, um, and as we think about, does this inform opinions? It really, I don't think is having much of a sway. I think that probably the economic dimension is much more important. And when we ask, do you follow this issue at all in the news? They a very small minority. In most countries say that they're following the Uyghur issue at all. And so um, there has apparently been, from what I'm, I, I've you know, heard, that a greater attention to this in some of the media, you know, Al Jazeera and others are covering this to a greater extent than before, but it hasn't really entered the public consciousness to a meaningful sense to help define China. So I think that, you know, really we're still in a, a period where 
where China is is viewed positively overall, but it hasn't really necessarily been defined in people's minds as clearly yet. So um, I think that partly explains why we don't see a huge amount of variation, except in a case like the, the Palestinian territories, where we do see that variation because of a very specific issue that China isn't really, you know, if they, you know, are not, are, you know, have some stances on and aren't really necessarily leading in a way that would help um, the Palestinian cause in a meaningful sense, kind of like Erdogan has done in Turkey. Yeah, so the, the Uyghur situation is is interesting because, you know, a lot of the media in the region is is state run, right? You don't see a lot of, you know, free media and it, there's not a lot of reporting on it. And I think there's right. a logic there that a lot of countries, A, see China as an important economic actor, B, appreciate the non-intervention domestic politics to, to whatever extent that exists in the region. Um, China's successfully framed this as their domestic problem in Tibet and Hong Kong. So we're not going right. to talk to you about what you do to Kurdish people or, you know, minorities in your state if you if you pay us the same courtesy. Um, yeah, for whatever reason, it just hasn't really gained much traction. Um, Palestine is interesting because China has always seen itself or portrayed itself as like the champion of the developing world. And that's something still that's that's very important in a lot of its outreach to the global south. And you could even see uh, when uh, the last big flare up in Gaza was in May 21, I think. And at that point, China held the, you know, the, the seat at the UNSC and uh, they, they were quite vocal and, and, you know, condemning Israel for it and saying they'll support the Palestinians. But that doesn't seem to translate into a lot of, uh, you know, like you're saying, it, it doesn't really seem to, to, to move the needle uh, among Palestinian publics. And I wonder, I mean, on the one hand, there's this rhetorical support, but on the other you know, Chinese export, or, yeah, Chinese exports into Palestine probably are, are you know, stifling for a lot of local uh, economic actors, and then you know, much greater um, trade on valuable stuff like tech with Israel. So I imagine Palestinians kind of see it as they're you know talking on both sides of their face on this issue. I, I think that's a huge part of it, and I also think that you know, as a global power, China can say things at the UN, but also it seems like it could take some initiative to try and you know lead something. I think it is in a different position. Um, in terms of power and and so words are great but i think that actions on the ground are trying to actually you know get some type of fair settlement um, beyond just condemning at the un or things like that is something that'd be meaningful and i think we have seen that 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 even um you know at least my sense is that that still the us has seen as obviously the, the broker on this if there were to be one not china that china hasn't really stepped up in that sense and i think that would be what would be more meaningful but also as you say i mean clearly it is a place that is um, I think the fact that Jordan and Palestine kind of go together on this with their shift against the the views of, of China and economic ties, um, that they don't necessarily want closer economic ties. It is also a fear of kind of the, the import. These are both countries that have, um, you know, kind of to the 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 fact that the Chinese imports can come in at such a, a cheap level may also be a threat to some of the domestic interests and things like that. So, so again, I, I think it's a, a complicated story. I mean, what we did really see, and I think this is something that, that um, Historically, we've seen higher levels of more countries ranking in in um, uh, in, in Palestine. That generally, we, the the numbers have not been as low as they have this time. But it's been kind of a decrease for almost all the countries except Turkey. And I think that is notable, just in the way that they've tried to, you know, in theory, break the blockade of Gaza, do these other very symbolic things that are really showing kind of an attempt to stand up. Whereas I think China, you know, words are good, but it's it's not as much as what others are doing. And I think that um, that China. If it is going to assume this global leadership position with the power that it has, would need to actually try and you know force Israel into some type of concession to the Palestinians to really win hearts and minds there. To the same extent, at this point, again, it is it is kind of an odd issue, or you know, just a it's an exceptional issue for the Middle East at this point. I think particularly is is the the survey was coming at a time where there were the peace agreements between the the Gulf states, between Sudan, Morocco, and others, and so I think the Palestinians are perhaps keenly aware of you know who was standing up for kind of their own what they perceive as their own self self-interest and, and china was not necessarily um you know helping to to either try and stop that or to to say anything to stand up and, and so it, it probably relates to, to some of those factors yeah I, I i think you're right i think china i mean obviously i'm not speaking for china but if i were you know in the standing committee of the ccp i think this is really not you know they they've they've created a special envoy for the israel palestine question they've they've tried to do you know they've they've talked about different initiatives but you know fundamentally the answer to these problems don't lie in beijing and i think everybody realizes right. that 
you know, um, they don't really have the history there. They don't have the expertise. They don't have the the personnel. And it just seems, you know, that it seems like everybody has to have a position, you know, on this issue if they want to be seen as a global power or, you know, relevant. But I really don't think China sees this as any place where it has much uh, leverage or influence. I, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, just looking at, at all of this, you know, um, data that you're collecting, I mean, what factors do you think um, feature in, in a country's or a society's positive or negative view? Is it primarily economic because it's not such an important actor in the region yet? I, I think that um, it's actually one of the hardest things we have to, to define. I mean, we, we have trying to figure out how is a country actually thought about in the mind. And that's one of the reasons we have typically not historically asked this question, you know, do you have a positive or negative view of a country? Because when we did ask this before, we'd get, you know, well, do you mean, uh, in the case of the United right. States, do you mean American movies? Do you mean like culture? Do you mean politics? Do you mean economics? But it just, this is kind of the, the thing. And so, I mean, we want to just take this overall view, but then, then tease it out. So we have asked a number of different questions in the past about specific different issues. And, I think, you know, one of the things that we've always found interesting is, is we've asked, you know, um, we ask a question uh, that, that doesn't appear in the report, but is kind of interesting, you know, despite um, the, the foreign policy countries, do you think that the people of a country are good people? And we generally find that in the United States, that there's a huge gap between ratings of the United States and the views of Americans overall. Um, and so I do think that there are these different pieces. And and one of the things that we asked, um, we actually, in, uh, a few years ago in Kuwait, were able to ask a question, you know, what do you think of, of people from China? Um, and it was the only country that we asked this question. It was a battery that was designed for the Gulf where there was a bit more interaction. And half of people said, we don't know. Um, we don't actually have any opinion. And I do think it kind of goes back to like thinking through how does a country come in? And, and the United States is very well known, for example. I mean, it's been obviously there for many years. And I think we can kind of track that. And it is one of the reasons in the support we try and compare the United States to China to think about the, the difference between these two global powers that have a lot of the same things. They have a lot of economic power. They have a lot of political power if they choose to use it and, and so on. And so trying to think about the two in comparison and, and how that plays out. But it is, it is something that I think um, is, is almost too complex and everyone has a slightly different view of what they're thinking of. Certainly the United States, the culture, um, we have seen a positive view and, and certainly we can see this politically like in Morocco after the US recognition of Western Sahara in exchange for the, the peace deal with Israel. Um, we did see a bump for the United States politically. And, and again, part of that is also hard to measure in the United States with the change of government. We have also seen uh, President Trump was very unpopular in the region. Biden is, is significantly more popular, not necessarily all that popular, but is, is almost on par in most countries with, with Xi, slightly below. But uh, but still, um, it is something that they're trying to think about the changes over time of how that plays out. And, and our general sense is that um, for China, it really is coming down to the economy. I mean, that's where we're seeing the movement. But it is... It is something that isn't necessarily, um, it, it, it's largely defined in terms of engagement. Um, for the United States, I think that so much of what we hear is about, uh, as we do these surveys, is about the Palestinian-Israeli issue. I mean, it's just as we as we think about the United States, its engagement, particularly in recent years, that is such a defining piece of the United States' engagement in the region or the wars in the countries that I think even if the United States does more economically, it's still going to struggle to overcome that kind of political past. Whereas China, I think, insofar as it can actually stay out of politics effectively, it really, I think, will be defined by its economic engagement in the region. And you know, certainly it tries to say we're not involved. It tries to say these um, things, but obviously there is an engagement. I mean, it, it certainly it does play a role behind the scenes, even as its economic choice is what it makes. And so I think a lot of that will become what defines China. And then I, I think there is the other possibility that there are these other issues. Um, you know, I, I think having spent some time there, I mean, there does seem to be when, the, when China comes in to do an infrastructure project, it does seem like it's a bit of a, a it's removed from the process. It's it's kind of, you know, set up to the side, not necessarily, you know, engaging the local workforce to the same extent as maybe a, a one that was done from a, a company outside of that might do. Again, that, that's just some perceptions that we, we don't have data on that specifically asking about it, but it is something that does seem like China setting itself up a little bit aside, not necessarily engaging as much. And so I don't know if, if there is more engagement between Chinese citizens and people of the region, how that will actually play out. I mean, a lot of this is yet to be determined, but I think that those interactions, particularly if we do bring down the number of people who say, or not if we do bring down, but if, if the number of people who say that they don't have an opinion of Chinese people does decrease, certainly the engagement and how those interactions go um, will largely define, I think, how China's viewed in the region going forward. So I, I think there's a lot of different factors here that will help 
um, define it, but but certainly I, I my own assessment is that probably in the next ten years China will really come into view for the Middle East, and there will probably be sort of be more fixed views of China itself, and then thinking um, about how. I don't think we'll see the, the shifts that we have seen in this last kind of four-year period anymore that probably unless something major happens, it will be kind of fixed. But it is, I think, still the getting to know you phase of of this engagement um, in most of the, the region. So it, it is a bit hard to say something that we will actually go back to in the next wave. They can continue to, again, trying to think about what is it that people have in mind when they hear the word China, basically. Well, I certainly can't wait to see the next wave. I mean, this every time one of these reports comes out, me and my little band of China media nerds get together on on WhatsApp or whatever, and we're like, oh, have you seen it yet? And, you know, it gives us a lot to talk about. Well, um, thank you so much, Jonathan. It's, uh, it's great. I really appreciate those kind words. Well, well, thank you. I mean, it, it really does. Uh, uh, it's a tremendous value for a lot of us, you know, not just academics, but I talk to folks who work in, in policy or, or media or whatever, and, and everybody finds this a really, really valuable, um, you know, uh, product you guys put out. So this latest report came out in August. Um, we're going to put a link to it on our show's page, and I really recommend everybody check it out. There's a lot of great data in there to, to, to unpack. Everybody should also check out the uh, Arab Barometer Twitter feed because you guys post a lot of really interesting links through that as well. Um, Michael, do you have anything else you're working on you'd like to tell us about? Any other things to promote? Um, well, so, so we are coming up with a full wave of data uh, for researchers who are interested. The full data set will be available. To, um, the microdata, you can download the data set in the end of September. So I'd encourage you to do that. We're also working, um, you should watch, as you say, our feed. We have uh, new reports coming out on the environment. The first time we've really done a, a major uh, series on the environment. We have really interesting findings on gender coming out. Um, so again, somewhat different than uh, the international relations I mentioned. We have a, a, and we have a, a report coming out on the economy. So these will be coming out in the coming weeks. And so certainly watch those web uh, sites and uh, our website and our Twitter feed, and we'll certainly have links to that. But we are excited for that. And then um, we're actually closing up this wave. We've finished the survey data and we'll begin uh, doing surveys again um, next year. So we're, we're kind of beginning the process of the new questionnaire. So if there are people who are interested, we're always interested to hear ideas, feedback, different ways we could ask questions. This is really, as you say, a public, um, project i mean the data are public and used for researchers so if there is an interest in in certain topics or different issues that maybe we've covered here maybe we haven't we're always happy to think about that and hear um feedback from people so we can hopefully do better surveys in the future so um please do reach out to me or our team and we'd be happy to to have a discussion excellent well michael thank you so much i really appreciate this this has been really uh enlightening really useful for us and i've really enjoyed it perfect thank you so much it's great to talk sure to you thing. And to the audience, thanks for joining us. Of course, follow us on social media, subscribe, review, and rate us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'll see you next episode. Thank you. Produced by HeartCast Media.